welcome to this uh, edition of agile india so happy to have you here before we get into neeraj session uh, here's just a little bit about him he is the head of engineering at solo.io a long term contributor and maintainer of the istio project previously co-founder and chief architect at aspen mesh that's neeraj for you without further ado over to you neeraj uh thanks usha let me just start with uh, sharing my screen so uh, hello and welcome everyone uh thanks for joining in on this session on security and observability for all apps and how you can leverage and combine the user and the kernel powers to get all the functionality you want uh and thanks usha for uh, introducing me and hosting this session uh just continuing on the intros uh, i am head of engineering at solo uh like usha said i've been a long time maintainer and contributor to the istio project and several other open source communities i'm currently on the istio technical oversight committee and a former steering committee member where i have been helping shape the direction of the project i'm also written a uh, a book secure application deployment with istio so if you're interested in istio please check it out and if you are uh if you have any questions or want to reach out you can always follow me on twitter my handle is nrj pota so with that let's get started so the agenda today is uh basically we're going to talk about how these different technologies whether it's ebpf and istio uh, service mesh cilium how are they related and how we can harness the power together right so i'm going to set the stage by giving some overview of where the cloud native security and observability is what are the business challenges that people face with microservices and how a service mesh is solving them and particularly we'll focus on istio but then move on to the functionality that ebpf provides right and we'll see that there's a lot of overlap between what ebpf and service mesh and cilium and istio can do now the aim here is to understand the benefits and limitations of each technology uh, nothing is perfect but at the same time we want to make sure you know we understand when to choose what and how to combine those powers and that's what i'll focus next i'll give you certain examples of where these two technologies can be layered together and then i'll just have you know one or two slides of what does it look like in the entire landscape if you look ahead right where is the industry heading and what are we doing and thinking in the community so if that sounds good to everyone i will kick it off all right so you know in the last 5 uh, or 6 years or maybe a decade we have been seeing the shift in almost all large industries it started with innovators where uh, people were breaking out the monolith into microservices right and this was largely driven by the business needs of they wanted more scalability they wanted to meet their user demands uh, they wanted to make sure uh, they are more uh, reliable they have more ha characteristics they reduce the cost they only scale the components that they want to scale which is what microservices gives you and then they wanted to have a better developer efficiency right so this is the agile in the conference the whole aim of microservices in a way is to make sure we are able to deliver more value to the customers quickly because we have smaller teams who have well scoped boundaries on what they are working on and they know how to interface with the other application teams better so all of this sounds really good right that's why you see in the cloud native space there is so many technologies that enable uh, businesses and organizations to move from monolith to microservices architecture while all of that being great what we see is when you have microservices at scale i'm not talking about 5 or 10 uh, we deal with companies who have 10000 20000 but even at like small number that 100 200 microservices right overall you will see a lot of challenges that crop up especially around operationalizing that scale so microservices by nature are written in different languages right so you want each developer team to be autonomous and they will make their own choices because they have different languages and runtime frameworks it's very difficult to get consistent security uh, consistent observability and reliability right so in the monolithic world it was all one code base so you can create you know you can just create libraries and you are done and you can share those libraries now there are different languages so you can't really create libraries right so how do you make sure you know you're surfacing the same metrics how do you make sure you have the same tls libraries all of these are lots of challenges that the operational and the developers team face because putting all of this logic in your application couples the developers and the operators that means it slows down the eventual game of eventual uh, you know giving more value to your customers quickly 
right? So we want developers and operators both to work independently, developers to write code, release, and then operators to make sure they can enforce organizational policies independent of developers' life cycle. So with these challenges is what uh, we came up with service mesh, right? So this is just setting the stage of what a service mesh is. So service mesh is an infrastructure layer. It's a transparent infrastructure layer that can manage communication between microservices, right? Because a lot of complexity comes around this communication between microservices, how do you secure it? How do you get visibility to make sure when something fails, you can debug it? How do you make sure, you know, when you want to route traffic, when you want to do canary, you do it without changing your applications. And that's what service mesh gives you. And the aim here, like I was saying, is developers can focus on business logic and operators can work independent and make a more resilient and secure environment. Right. So Istio is one of the most popular uh, service mesh uh, projects. Uh, it is open source. Uh, it is now uh, very soon, uh, you know, going to be part of CNCF. I have been working on Istio for the past five years. I have helped build the community and lead it and shape the direction of the project. Right. So for me, uh, Istio was uh, innovative in many ways, particularly around the architecture we came up with on how to solve this coupling of developers and operators. And this architecture is what we call a sidecar proxy architecture. So on the right, you will see a diagram. So this is a typical Kubernetes environment. So we have in, in this environment, applications running as pods. So we have two applications, uh, app A and app B. And then, what we do is we add a proxy right next to that application. This is what you see as an Envoy proxy. So Envoy, if you don't know, is a very, very powerful and performant proxy written in C++. It was originally developed by the Lyft engineering team. It is now part of, again, CNCF. So what we do here is we inject this proxy inside the pod as an additional container. And in Kubernetes, a nice uh, thing is anything that is part of a pod, they share the same networking namespace. So in a way, this proxy can see the packets going in and out of the application, right? And uh, what we are doing is we are automatically intercepting this traffic coming out of the application uh, into the proxy and then sending it out. Similarly, any, any traffic that is coming into the pod or for the application first goes through the proxy and then to the application. So what that means is because on web proxy here, is in the middle of all application traffic, it can do the things for securing it. It can give visibility metrics and it can do traffic shifting, for example, routing, right? So this is what this layer is what we call the data plane of the Istio service mesh. The data plane composes of all the on web proxies that are talking to each other. And that's where the request traffic actually flows. Now, in order to configure these on web proxies, we have a component called Istio D, which is called the control plane. So Istio D is basically a control plane or a controller whose job is to look at the Kubernetes API server. It will discover what are the services that are there in your cluster. It will also discover what the user provided configuration is and then convert it into the configuration for Envoy, right? So it's like a translation layer and it provides an abstraction so that people who are configuring Istio, they don't have to worry about, you know, the low level configuration of Envoy. They can just, uh, look at a higher level Kubernetes driven configuration, and then uh, they get a service mesh. Uh, and uh, another important thing that Istio D does is manages the identity so that these proxies, when they talk to each other, all the traffic is encrypted, right? And the way it works is uh, Istio D will automatically create certificates. These are X509 certificates with strong identity built into them. And then as they expire, before they expire, Studio will automatically rotate. So if you see a lot of this complex functionality that you want to make sure your environment is resilient, a proxy and the service mesh will do, and STOD can automatically configure it, make sure you have certificates available. Additionally, there's a lot of metrics that the proxies expose when the traffic is flowing through them, and these metrics can automatically be exported to something like Prometheus, right? So if you see this is a complete system, and a platform that gives you security, reliability, and observability. And like I was saying, it is widely used, uh, heavily used in production. They are a very large community. And if you haven't played around with this too, I will, highly, I will uh, you know, heavily recommend that you do and give us feedback on how to improve it, right? Uh, 
So moving on, so this is what the networking initiative looks like. I briefly described it, but this is good to understand how the traffic flows and how Istio and the service mesh player is able to provide these functionalities, right? So the proxies will handle all the traffic coming in and out of the application container. The redirection is done transparently. So what I mean by that is we add IP table rules inside the pod networking namespace. These IP table rules are written in a way so that all the traffic going out from the application comes into the proxy and all the traffic coming from outside first goes to the proxy and then the proxy sends it to the application container if needed, right? So this is what we call the IP table redirection. Uh, there are two ways in which these IP table rules can be inserted. One is by an init container mode in which we add an init container in the pod that will set up these IP table rules before the application container or the sidecar comes up. And we also support the CNI mode in case you have not willing to give uh, privileges to insert IP table rules in the init container, right? So I'm going to now change uh, to the eBPF side so that so that we understand what eBPF and Cilium are. So we understand what service mesh is now, hopefully, and what Istio and how and the Istio architecture and how Istio provides these benefits, right? So coming to another related technology, which is very exciting and uh, evolving in the space is eBPF, right? So eBPF stands for extended Berkeley packet filter. So it's an evolution of the classic BPF. So if you have played around with TCP dump, TCP dump as a library or as a tool, you know, but once it does the parsing of the arguments you have given at the back end is it invokes BBPF hooks. These BBPF hooks are networking hooks that can be invoked, right? Or that are called whenever any networking event happens in the kernel. Uh, eBPF extended that functionality and now provides a way to basically run custom programs for lots more things than just networking. And these programs are user space programs that can be added in the kernel that are running in a sandboxed environment. So what that means is, you know, the kernel verifies that the program is safe. It won't crash the kernel. It is guaranteed to run. You can't have infinite loops there. And then it is also safe in terms of memory access. So uh, this is very different than what a loadable kernel module is. If you have played around with Linux kernels, you will uh, know that there's a way of extended kernel functionality through LKMs. While those are great, they, all, they are also very risky. They can uh, blow up your entire kernel if you don't know what you're doing, right? With eBPF, you can't do that. That's why this technology is so exciting, right? And these, uh, event-based programs, right? So these are what, what I was saying. These programs can be attached to hooks and these hooks can be networking hooks, you know, K probes, uh, tracing. So there's a lot of uh, benefit and things that you can do with eBPF, which I will just cover next. Uh, I see some of the questions that are being asked. Uh, what I will do is I will ask the question, I will answer them once we are done with the presentation so that I can get to the entire content, but please keep on asking. I'll definitely answer everything. So why am I excited about eBPF, all right? And especially if I've been working in service mesh and Istio for so long. So like I was saying, the three functionalities that we get from Istio and service mesh, we can also get from eBPF. Uh, for example, with networking and reliability, since eBPF is built on the classic BPPF, which was designed for efficient filtering, right? Packet filtering. It's a no brainer that you can do a lot of advanced things in eBPF, right? So you can drop packets, you can send traffic to somewhere else, uh, and you can do a programmatic access of packets in the kernel uh, networking stack, which is much more efficient doing it in a user space, right? Secondly, when it comes to uh, security, because uh, eBPF gives you hooks at so many low level events, you can codify your policies, right? Or you can monitor sensitive operations beyond just networking. So you can do things for file access, for example, or uh, some other key event that you want to monitor and you can block it or allow it. Uh, additionally, you know, eVPF programs, since they work so well with networking, you know, it's like a very good fit for classic network security problems or firewalling, right? And remember, all of these things are gonna be running in kernel. Uh, so in a way, a user application cannot avoid it, which is different than when you are uh, 
doing the things in a sidecar proxy architecture, right? Because if you don't have the sidecar, basically uh, you don't get the functionality with eBPF because it's in the kernel, every application you get, right? Or every pod, if you're talking about Kubernetes. And for observability, you can attach the eBPF functions to any function. You can extract data metrics. I'll talk to you next about the eBPF architecture, how eBPF programs can send back to the user space these metrics and uh, traces, and then you can send it eventually to your monitoring tool like Prometheus, right? And the main thing that I want to uh, express here is that eBPF is highly, highly performant. And because it's performant and efficient, you can process raw events as they're happening in the kernel, right? Which is not usually possible from a user space library, but the eBPF, you can do that. So uh, quickly, this is the eBPF architecture, right? So a user creates an eBPF program, uh, that can be in C, C++, or some other higher level languages they support. You use the Clang LLVM compiler, you are creating a bytecode. Bytecode is your portable uh, code format. So that gets loaded into the kernel. So, right, so left side is user space, the right side is kernel. Once it gets in the loaded in the kernel, the kernel will verify the, verify the bytecode so that there are no infinite loops, it will run to completion, it is memory safe. And then the just-in-time compiler will change it to a machine code. Now this machine code is now, uh, inserted will be running into the kernel. So the thing is you can have uh, outputs from that program exposed to the user space via what we call eBPF maps. These eBPF maps are very, very powerful way of exchanging data between the user space and the kernel space and they're very efficient. So for example, you can think of, I have a program that runs uh, which uh, only allows certain traffic based on IPs. So that will be running here. Through the maps, you can automatically add which IPs are allowed, which are not. So you don't have to recompile it again. And also through these maps, you can get the information back, which of the uh, requests were blocked and which were not allowed. So now you can create alerts and metrics on it, right? So you can see uh, why this is so powerful. And you know what are the kinds of things you can do with eBPF? So Cilium uh, is a cloud networking overlay or uh, uh, it's signed off as a CNI, a Kubernetes Container Network plugin, which is built on the eBPF technology, right? So Cilium as an open source project is part of CNCF allows a lot of functionalities like load balancing, policy. It is a very scalable CNI and it gives metrics and policy troubleshooting. So as you can see from both the Istio service mesh and Cilium eBPF layer, there's a lot of overlap, right? Both of these things are doing kind of similar kinds of functionalities, but there's a lot of trade-offs. And this is what we want to discuss next, right? So what's the benefit of a service mesh and, and using Istio and what are the limitations? And then we are gonna talk about uh, eBPF and Cilium, right? So for Istio, the key thing that you should understand is we are inserting a very, very powerful proxy, even though it's user space, this proxy is very feature rich. Now it's among the second or the third most used proxies in the world after maybe Nginx. It has a, it is a layer seven proxy. So there's a native support for a lot of other protocols, not just HTTP, HTTP2, even quick, but uh, you know, things like Dynamo, uh, MySQL. So, because it understands those protocols, it can give you information like metrics uh, relevant to that layer, right? Relevant to that protocol. It can also uh, do securities relevant to that, right? So the fine-grained security is basically that. So because it can pass layer seven, you can write rules like, I want this service to access slash foo, but not slash path. It is allowed to do a get operation for example, not a put. So, so that's the kind of functionality with Istio you can get. Additionally, like I was saying, Istio is, a, is natively supports encryption, automatically rotating the identities and certificate. So uh, out of the box, if you add the sidecar, you can get layer seven support if you want. And also you will get end-to-end -end, uh, MTLS encryption, very strong encryption. And then the telemetry, which is supported because it's parsing layer seven is very, very rich. And then in Istio, the way we insert the sidecar proxy is by automatic injection, right? So we add a mutating webhook in, in Kubernetes, which will change the pod and add the 
sidecar automatically. The good thing about this is the sidecar comes and goes or lives and dies with the pod. If the pod goes away, the sidecar goes away. If the pod restarts, the sidecars come up with it. So it's a very uh, easy way of management, low overhead in terms of operational complexity to the users. While there are so many benefits, there are still some limitations that come with service mesh, right? So the key thing is all features are relying on sidecars. And you will have to inject the sidecar to make sure you get policy, you get encryption, you get telemetry. And you have to make sure the application cannot bypass the sidecar. All of this is in the user space, right? And all of this is in the same pod as the application container. So uh, it's not as strongly enforced as something that can run in the kernel. Uh, secondly, the IP table redirection that I was saying that is done to get the traffic from application pod to the uh, sidecar proxy pod. This only works currently for TCP traffic. Uh, we can make it work for UDP, but there are some limitations that we are dealing with. That's why we, it works for TCP. And then the way we are injecting the sidecars uh, to the webhook uh, methodology, it, it requires the pod to restart. Now, this sometimes is an operational overhead and a no-go for various companies that at least we talk with, right? So they have applications they are running. They don't want to restart it. They don't want to change anything. And they say, we want to get service mesh-like functionality. How can I get security, visibility, and reliability, right? And then lastly, because of these sidecars are added for every pod, they can be a resource consumption uh, problem, uh, especially if you're not tuned the configurations correctly. At the same time, you know, since you're adding proxies on both the sides, there is latency that comes with it. So there are impacts to performance. Now you have to do that trade-off whether you know that uh, impact is you know beneficial compared to the uh, features you're provide you're getting out of the proxy, right? So you are offloading things like MTLS. So MTLS adds overhead, but if your requirement is doing MTLS, then your application will have to do it, right? Uh, overall, I mean, we have tuned the proxy and the Istio architecture well, so the overhead is minimal, but you know it's not zero. Uh, coming to the next, uh, coming to the eBPF benefits and limitations, right? So uh, in the eBPF side of things, our Cilium, we are enforcing the security and observability in the kernel. Like I was saying, because in the kernel layer, you cannot bypass it. Uh, it's not like the sidecars, where if you don't add the sidecars, you don't get it. So this is huge. Uh, especially for applications which can't add sidecar or there are huge environments in which you know it will take time to add things to the mesh you have access to very low level uh, kernel events uh, that obviously even a proxy can't access right so proxy has limitations of only accessing networking things with ebpf you can do anything you want in the kernel and it is very very performant right but at the same time there are a few limitations uh, because it's the kernel level, uh, you can only do uh, layer four, right? It only supports layer four parsing. Uh, you can only deal with TCP, UDP, IPs, and ports. You don't get a sense of the high level protocols, right? So kernels only stop at layer four right now. So that means you cannot get uh, request-based metrics for HTTP. You can only get connection-oriented metrics. And, and for because it's not doing layer seven parsing, you cannot do fine grained policy. So you cannot, you can only say this IP and port can talk to this IP and port. You cannot say, you know, I want to do a, I want to allow a get request to admin, but not a put request. And also a big difference between using uh, EBPF and Cilium compared to Istio is uh, in Istio, we are creating strong cryptographic identities via certificates that we add for each sidecars. And these certificates, these identities are based on the service account. In Cilium, uh, we don't have that provision, right? So we are using IPs as a way of doing workload identity. Now, there are some limitations that come when you use IPs because uh, IPs get recycled. There might be a lag in which an IP is recycled and the system is observing things. So, uh, you know, uh, that's one of the limitations that you have to uh, live with if you are dealing with the kernel, right? So a question that always comes up when I'm talking with customers or in the community is, okay, so these technologies provide similar things. 
uh, when should I use what and uh, you know, can I leverage them together, right? And for me, the key here is where this entire space is heading is we should be able to leverage the user and kernel space together to get the advanced functionality we want. So you saw no one technology is perfect here. They all have the benefits and limitations, but if you're able to combine their power, you get the best of both worlds. And that's what I want to focus on uh, next. Let me see. So there is one question. Maybe I can answer that. Uh, so Ame, you're asking uh, all traffic routes through Istio, how performance is managed and is only for Kubernetes or any cloud provider. So that's a really good question. So like I was saying, uh, the performance overhead, the latency overhead is minimal. We have worked really hard to make sure traffic going through the proxy doesn't add a lot of overhead, but there is some overhead. It works on Kubernetes in the sense that the control plane for Istio has to run on Kubernetes. The data plane proxy, uh, it can run on a Kubernetes environment. It can be added in a pod, or you can even have virtual machines in which you can add the sidecar proxy. So we also support VMs. For cloud providers, it is supported on any cloud provider that supports Kubernetes, right? Because primarily Kubernetes is a layer of abstraction. Uh, does that answer your question? I hope so. All right, so let me continue and please keep asking questions and uh, we can make it more interactive. Uh, so moving on to how we can leverage them together, right? So there are three easy use cases that I will show how we can come in which we can combine both sidecar proxies and EVPF or Cilium, right? So this is the first use case. So remember I was saying to get the traffic from the sidecar to from application to the sidecar, we need to uh, let's see. So we need to use IP tables. And what the IP tables does is the application sends a traffic to the proc is sending a traffic to some other application, but will intercept it. It goes to the socket layer, goes to the network stack. And then from the network stack has to go through the sidecar proxies network stack up again. So the packet traverses just because this IP table interception, the packet traverses the user in the kernel space twice, right? So this is when you are using the IP tables ways of interception. What we can do is we can accelerate this data path interception with eBPF. So eBPF allows you to attach programs on any socket. And what you can do basically is have an eBPF program attached to this socket where it will just send the packets that are coming out of the application directly to the proxy. So it doesn't have to go through the whole TCP IP stack twice. So if you see, this is so powerful. Now you get the same functionality uh, as uh, with the IP tables redirect, but now you are getting a lot more performance because you know TCP IP stack is, uh, is, is very optimized, but still traversing it twice is not needed. Additionally, because you're not using IP tables here, you can see that this EVPF way, uh, way of intercepting works for both TCP and UDP, right? So this is just one way of how we have combined STO and uh, EVPF to get more and better functionality out of what we want, right? So the second functionality, and this is my favorite, which I always say is the defense in depth, right? So Istio provides layer seven authorization policies. It provides fine grain control for layer seven. It gives you service account based strong cryptographic identities, which is great. But if you don't have a sidecar, you don't get that functionality. Or if you bypass that sidecar, so suppose you are under an attack vector and the attacker has, in the, has uh, you know, reached the application container, right? it has bypassed the sidecar, it doesn't matter now. Right, all the policies that you have won't be enforced. eBPF and Cilium as a CNI layer, they provide layer four uh, policy support, right? So you can say this uh, IP and port can talk to this IP and port, uh, or this cannot talk to that. The good thing about that is even if the attacker is, you know, has, has, has escaped and reached your application pod, if it hasn't, if the attacker hasn't broken into the kernel, 
they cannot escape this, right? All the traffic that goes through will still be, the, the policies will be enforced. So what we suggest is if you want defense in depth, you can combine both the two uh, layers. So you can use Kubernetes network policies. So Kubernetes network policies basically gives you a higher level policy object in which you can say, hey, I want to have traffic to my pod called app pet store uh, be you know receive traffic only from uh, spots which have the service account name foo right so you can create an access pol a network policy like that if you're using Celium, Celium will pick up this network policy and automatically enforce this via ebpf so so when a new uh, virtual interface is created from the cni for each for any pod you can even attach programs in that virtual interface. And what Celium does is make sure it filters packets based on what allowed or not at that layer. So basically, if you create a network policy like this and you're using Celium in the eBPF layer, you can see uh, service account foo is allowed to talk to pet store, but bar won't be account. And, and this will basically be managed at an IP and a port layer. So the Celium uh, control plane or the Celium agent will be monitoring when these pods come up, what are the IP addresses, and then it will block the traffic based on this policy. But you can still continue to use your uh, Istio layer seven policies, right? So even when this traffic is allowed, you might want to say that foo can only reach and make a get call to slash admin to pet store and not uh, do a put or a post on admin. That you cannot do with Celium, but you can do with, uh, but you can do that with Istio. So if you see, if you have combined those two layers, you you make sure, even if the sidecar is bypassed or the sidecar doesn't exist, you have basic layer four policies, and then you do advanced micro segmentation using layer seven policies. This is a very powerful concept. Uh, I always recommend for folks who are doing security and want to do defense in depth, try to layer these together and get more functionality or better security. And the last thing that I want to talk about is observability, right? So you get some observability from Celium and eBPF, you get some observability from Istio and Service Mesh, but if you combine them, actually, you get the best of both worlds. So here's an example, right? So I have uh, two nodes. And in one of my nodes in the pod pet store, I have the sidecar proxy injected, but in the applications bar and foo, I don't have sidecars, right? So either I'm just migrating them or they are legacy applications. I don't want to touch them, right? Which is a very normal scenario for everyone. So when you are, when you have a sidecar, the sidecar will inject lots of telemetry, especially layer seven telemetry around uh, how many requests are there? Uh, what's the status code? you know, what uh, Kubernetes pods and services is associated with who is talking to that, who is talking to what, the sizes of the requests, the duration. So you can get a lot of higher level service level metrics. And you can have Prometheus scrape it, right? So this is beautiful, you know, right out of the box, you get a lot of metrics. For the applications which don't have a sidecar now, now you're stuck. You don't get the service level metrics, so you can only get application level metrics, right? So if you have application level metrics, you know, you rely on the application and foo and bar, for example, can be in different languages. You have to make sure they are surfacing consistent telemetry. So you get the same visibility. You can create dashboards and understand what's happening, right? But the best part is if you have eBPF running, you can have eBPF generate metrics on any of these networking events, right? So uh, for example, when a TCP connection is open from pets from food to pet store, the eBPF uh, agents can surface that metrics saying these two are talking and these are the types of data that this is the size of the data that has gone out. Or if the traffic was blocked, it can also uh, surface metrics saying this traffic was blocked. The good thing is you don't need a sidecar for it, right? So if you have combined both the Istio and the eBPF layer, so you can have uh, these uh, eBPF programs 
get invoked when specific hook happens, they will get those metrics out to the user space program and then Prometheus can scrape them just as it will scrape Istio. So whether you have a sidecar or not, you still get the baseline metrics for everything. And when you have the sidecars injected, you get even more metrics and even more rich data. And this is how you can combine these layers and get a lot of advanced functionalities. Uh, just lastly, I think I have like on four minutes left. Now I wanted to share what uh, the future looks like for both STU and eBPF and Cilium, uh, especially as the cloud native uh, landscape and the technologies involved. So for me, both of them are very, very exciting technologies, right? Like I've been sharing throughout the presentation, there's a lot of benefits from each of them. But then when you layer them together, you get a lot of advanced and enhanced functionality. Uh, uh, again, folks who have been familiar with Istio might know, but if not, we recently announced a new architecture in Istio. It's called Ambient. In fact, my company, Solo and Google, we were partnering together for the last few months and we were together building this and we open source. So Ambient Mesh is a new architecture in Istio, which allows the proxy to be injected in a non sidecar mode, right? So currently in Istio, only you can inject the proxy in the sidecar proxy in the same pod as the application container. What we found out was, like I was saying, for some of the applications, it's difficult to add the sidecar. Uh, it adds a bit of overhead in terms of resource and performance that customers don't like. So we have come up with a new architecture called sidecarless architecture, which relies on node-based proxies. This node-based proxies are going to be run at layer four. So if you just want mutual TLS between services, you can get a lot of performance, low resource utilization, low operational complexity by just using the layer four proxy in the nodes. We call it Z-tunnels. But if you want layer seven functionality, you have to add another proxy, which is called Waypoint proxy. And the traffic goes from your application to Z-tunnels to the Waypoint proxy back to the service. Uh, it's very difficult to explain the entire architecture in the two minutes, but I just want to say, uh, this is happening based on the feedback we have received. But even in this architecture, I still see VPF playing a very important role, right? You, you can even, uh, how the traffic goes from the application pod to the per node proxy, you can still have eBPF doing acceleration. You, can, you still want eBPF involved when you want security in depth. So for me, uh, you know, even with the evolved architecture, these two technologies still play together. And then lastly, there's a lot of exciting developments happening. Uh, uh, I'm leading the efforts in Istio. I'm also leading the efforts in Solo. Uh, we have uh, created a higher level APIs and a platform so that with one API, you can get security and observability in depth. If you And we will install and manage Istio and eBPF both for you, right? So that's the benefit uh, that we can provide. Otherwise, you have to deal with multiple different APIs. You have to create a Kubernetes network policy. You have to create a Istio authorization policy, which can get messy. And you have to make sure the metrics that are coming out of the similar format. All of that is handled by us. So I'm really excited to, you know, that I've got a chance to present today. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions or if you have any feedback. Uh, I'm happy to connect here. Also, you can reach out to me on uh, Twitter. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions I can answer? I think no more questions, Neeraj. Thank you so much, Neeraj, for uh, sharing uh, all your experience and insight. And I'm sure the uh, attendees uh, got a lot from your session. Mm -hmm.